Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, a super special uh, meetup of the Portland Python Pirates. Uh, my name is Chris Thompson, uh, kind of the lead uh, uh, coordinator for the Portland Python Pirates meetup. Uh, you can visit our website at portlandpythonpirates.org to get a bunch of Python resources, connect with us, apply to be a speaker, uh, any of the above. And um, tonight we're going to hear a presentation from Linnea Pai, well, Linnea, uh, about the open source library Linnea Pai. Uh, Doris is with us to talk about that. She's the CEO of Linnea. Um, Linnea Pai is an open source library that simplifies the creation of data pipelines by automatically cleaning up and refactoring data science code and enabling the creation of reusable components. It has a whole host of other features um, and I'll let Doris kind of get into that. Uh, without further ado, Doris, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Chris. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share more about Linea today. So as Chris already mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Linea, which is the company that brought Linea Pi to you. Uh, previously, I was, did my PhD at UC Berkeley in the RISE lab. This is a lab that created Spark and Ray, among other things. So we kind of have a knack for building data systems to make data scientists' life easier. Uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn, over email, um, always love to chat. So for today, I wanted to make this uh, more practical. I have a demo prepared and I want to kind of give everybody a good overview of the sort of problems that we're solving and then dive straight into a more hands-on experience. And I save time at the end for more of the theor theoretical pieces when if there's time. But. Um, overall, want this to be interactive, want this to be practical. All right, so before we dive into Linea, let's just talk a little bit about what, what is this whole data science productionization process. So this is kind of a pretty typical experience where we have data engineers, so that's what these little logos are, and data scientists working side by side to take raw data science development all the way into production, right? So here we're seeing a couple of different tasks being carried out by the various different personas. Uh, first, we have the data engineer set up data infra, and then the data scientists are locally or you know developing in some development environment, uh, analyzing data, developing models. And when they're ready with a model that's performing well, then there's a handoff, right? The, the notebook that's being handed off to the data engineers to refactor, to clean up, to create pipelines. And then these pipelines that we create are then deployed uh, to the, the production environment that's been set up. And these pipelines are constantly generating data that's being fed into end applications, right? And uh, during this entire process, there is a data engineer who is in charge of maintaining the pipelines, making sure that everything is running, everything is running correctly, and when, things go down, how do we debug it? How do we bring things back up quickly? Right? So this is kind of the end-to-end -end data science productionization experience. There are a lot of issues in this picture, as you can imagine. So the, and there are kind of different uh, flavors of issues depending on the organizational structure that uh, one is at. So for a bigger organization that has data engineers and data science functions working side by side, uh, what we see are some common issues are, of course, the data scientist feels like they're constantly having to rewrite the same logic uh, by tweaking little things because, you know, it, it never uh, is directly reusable, but a lot of the logic is the same. So it feels like reinventing the wheel over, over again. Um, and for the data engineers who need to create pipelines, and Chris, it sounds like this is, might be something that you have experienced before, is that uh, data scientists are constantly bringing similar issues to the engineer, and the engineers can have a hard time deciphering what the code is about sometimes. And uh, other issues are on the data scientist side. Sometimes it feels like, well, I don't know if the data engineer's refactoring is going to preserve my logic because they don't have the science background. So there's also that correctness concern. And eventually on the ma maintenance side, the engineers are constantly struggling with, you know, managing a whole host of pipelines and it's unclear whether there are latent issues. When pipelines go down, debugging can be difficult because, you know, the pipelines are all interrelated and they are writing over each other. They are touching upon the same data assets. 
So for debugging, um, we really need the data scientists and data engineers working side by side to really figure out what's going on. And we require a lot of shared context in that workflow. Okay, so at uh, smaller organizations, there are sometimes organizations that tend to have what we call full stack data scientists. So they do a lot of the engineering in a self-service fashion. Um, so that means setting up their own infra, uh, creating pipelines themselves, deploying pipelines and maintaining pipelines, right? So even at bigger organizations, we're starting to see this trend because this kind of really minimizes the handoff between different functions and that can accelerate the end-to-end -end cycle. Um, but the issue is here, again, you know, we're constantly rewriting logic with small tweaks. Data scientists may or may not be familiar with the data infra tool stack that they're setting up. Um, and because sometimes they're not familiar with the pipeline uh, frameworks, they have to kind of rethink about how they want to express the workflow. And they have to spend a pretty time, you know, a long process of like constantly having to change the data science notebook into pipelines. And of course, um, right, so, so these are some common issues we see with full stack data scientists. And of course, you know, the same issues from before about maintaining pipelines, debugging, all of that still applies. So how does linear pi come into the picture? We come into the picture in a couple pretty important ways. So the first one is, Chris mentioned that we help people create these reusable components. So what LinearPy is able to do is, you know, while data scientists are doing data analysis, doing some ad hoc work, we can automatically package some of these commonly used functions by cleaning up the code and packaging it into reusable functions that can easily be parameterized differently. So we don't have to be as concerned about this may not apply because I have to tweak it all the time. Like there are many different flexible ways for us to parameterize a function as needed, right? And when we say clean up code, this means that we're not just taking an entire notebook and shoving it into a single function. We're actually uh, analyzing the code to figure out what's necessary, what's not, uh, how do we have the minimal set of uh, code that actually encapsulates the function that we care about. Right, so that means if you're doing a lot of uh, exploratory data analysis, and at the end of it, there is a piece, a piece of business logic that needs to be put into a function for data transformation, we are able to automatically remove a lot of that EDA work that doesn't actually contain the end business logic. Right, and then the other piece that Linear Pi does and that's very powerful is that with literally just a single API call, we automatically generate data pipelines from notebooks. Um, and not only do we do it with a single API call, we do it with all of these different frameworks as well. So you can simply specify that I want my pipeline to be in Airflow. I want my pipeline to be in Argo. Uh, by the way, Chris, Kubeflow is not supported, so please uh, test drive it and break it and let us know uh, what you know, what other features we need to uh, develop, develop there. Uh, Ray is also something that we've integrated. DVC has a pipeline functionality that's also integrated as well. And uh, we also, um, LinearPy works with a backend storage system. It can be local, it can be with S3 or uh, GCS. So it really is very powerful in that it's framework agnostic, agnostic and it's very easy for us to bring new integrations online, and it also integrates with existing infra. So uh, I know folks usually have their own in-house airflow, they have their own in-house S3 already, so this is a pretty light way, way of connecting the different pieces together. All right, um, any questions before I move on to just talk a little bit more about the tech? Okay. So let's go straight to the next slide. So this is just giving us a very high level overview of the uh, open source experience. And then we'll actually go through an end-to-end -end, um, tutorial to get a better sense of what these different APIs do. So at the very beginning of the experience, when the data scientist is working in Jupyter, in uh, Databricks Notebook, Colab, or just simple Python scripts, VS code, right? Like, so whatever envir uh, development environment, so long as it's Python, we can interoperate with it. So the first step is to 
import the LinearPy library. So um, obviously install it and then import the LinearPy library into your development uh, environment. So what that does is allows us to automatically capture everything that you're doing and build what we call the linear graph in the background. And what this graph does, it's analyzing your code to understand at a very fine grain level how the different functions they are calling, how the different variables are related to each other. And this understanding allows us to do a lot of really powerful things. So one really powerful thing that we're able to do is packaging things into what we call linear artifacts. These artifacts are pretty different from artifacts in like model registries where it's just a blob of data that's uh, serialized somewhere, right? Like the linear artifact contains a lot more. It contains the value itself serialized in some fashion. It contains the code for generating that value. And it also contains execution context. So that means what library versions were needed to generate this um, in, and you know all the necessary information to be able to regenerate if necessary, right? And all of this happens by you simply calling uh, the linear save API. And the way that we're doing this in the back end is we are, you know, whenever you're calling save on uh, anything, it can be a variable, it can be a function, it can even be uh, a side effect operation. And what we mean by side effect is anything that modifies a uh, state outside of the Python environment. So it can be writing to a nest three bucket, uh, reading from a database. These are all what we consider side effects. And you can even point to these operations um, as linear artifacts, right? So that usually means like the pointer is actually pointing to one of these nodes on the graph. And uh, in the background, what we we're doing then is um, traversing the graph to understand what is the necessary um, set of code, a set of instructions that need to be encapsulated into the artifact and ignore the rest. And then these pipelines, or sorry, these artifacts allows us to, using another simple API, to be able to create art, uh, to be able to create pipelines automatically. So essentially what we do is we give the two pipeline a list of artifacts and how they're related to each other. And automatically we are able to generate uh, airflow pipelines. Uh, Spark and Dask are aspirational future work, but we already saw earlier that we also integrate with Argo, uh, Ray, uh, Kubeflow, and DBC. And again, bringing one of these new integrations online is actually not as much effort as you think because of the way that we have designed the abstractions. All right, so uh, I know everybody's kind of itching to really see this in action, so I'm happy to dive straight into a tutorial with us. Uh, feel free to scan the QR code uh, and hop on this notebook alongside me. Uh, you can also go to this notebook by going to our GitHub repo and just going down to the README, and uh, this is where you would find that link. Great. All right, so this is kind of a really quick walkthrough of the backend architecture. Um, not gonna dwell too much on it, but it's essentially what's happening is, as I mentioned earlier, as you import the library, it allows us to start tracking everything you do. And it also uh, instantiates a backend storage that the artifacts are being uh, written to uh, and also being retrieved from. Uh, and so that's how this save um, API is interacting with the backend is to store and the get API is retrieving uh, previously saved artifacts. Sorry, and this, Doris, are you meant to be sharing a notebook right now? I am. So how's that? Perfect. Thanks. Thank, thank you for bringing that. Yeah, pointing that out. I didn't realize I was not sharing my whole window. So <laughs> no problem. All right, cool. So as I was just saying, um, when you know the first experience is to import the library into the Python development environment, and that allows us to start tracking everything um, that you're doing, and we, it, we're also instantiating a, a linear storage backend. And so, if that's not available, uh, we'll instantiate it. Otherwise, we'll connect to an existing ins uh, instance of it. And uh, then the two uh, save and get APIs are uh the link let me maybe drop it into the chat so it's easier for folks oh there it is 
Great, thank you so much. All right, so um, so save is saving artifacts, get is retrieving artifacts, and the two pipeline is uh, generating a set of files that allows us to automatically deploy this to a target orchestrator and be able to start running it. Uh, I'll go through each of these uh, APIs in the next uh, set of demos. So um, let's see, do do I dare? Let's let's see. So this might take a second to get everything uh, installed. Great. All right. So, um, so LinearPy is a library, and it also exists as a Jupyter extension. So inside of a Jupyter-esque environment such as Colab, we have to uh, load the extension as well to basically tell us that we now need to instrument the kernel in order to start capturing everything. All right, so we're going to go through a very simple workflow that does some uh, data, very simple data transformation. It does some um, plotting to gain some understanding of the data. Uh, and then we're training a very small model on it. So it's a very simple uh, workflow, I'm sure most data science workflows that folks are uh, working with are much more complex, but um, we don't want the complexity of the workflow to get in the way of understanding linear pi. Cool. All right, so now we just run this very simple workflow. And what we want to do next is to be able to first save the model. Um, and so we point to the model variable that we find up here and we give it a name, iris model. And this creates a linear artifact. And, um, and this is being persisted into the stories that we just talked about. So in the different session, even, you know, you can do it the same session, different session, different notebook. Uh, we now have a way of checking out the artifact that we just stored. So this is a really nice mechanism of passing work across uh, different sessions. But what's really, really interesting is that the artifact doesn't just have the value. It actually shows us the exact code for generating the, the model, right? Um, so if we actually compare the code that's being uh, output here versus what really happened here, we'll notice that this plotting uh, logic that actually didn't impact the data at all, this is just for like, human understanding that was removed from the code that we store for the model. And rightfully so, because it doesn't actually help us generate the model, right? So this is what we meant earlier by how we can clean up the code, how we can ex remove extraneous pieces so we only have the necessary and relevant logic. Great, so uh, now let's just create a very simple pipeline. We'll just use just the model itself uh, to so we can easily give it you know a list of different artifacts we can potentially create more artifacts with uh, the data frame itself um, and we can also create artifacts with like different parts of you know, different points in the data frame transformation so those are all available options for creating artifacts but for now for the purpose of this demo let's just focus on a single artifact and try to create a pipeline out of it Right, so let's do this, great. So this generates four files for us. So there's the module file, there is the requirements.txt file, there is the pipeline DAC file itself and a Docker file, right? So what do each of these um, files do? So let's first make sure that everything got generated, great. Now, uh, all right, let's, so this is, now I'm going off script a little bit. So let's actually take a peek inside of what the files are doing. Um, let's see. All right, so let's take a look at the module file first. Great. So what this is doing is, is creating uh, functions that compute each of the artifacts. And um, so this allows us to 
basically just keep the uh, logic without having to marry it to any specific uh, frameworks yet. And that's how we create uh, really easy integration points. So the core logic is isolated into its own module file. Um, and then there is the DAC file that wraps this module file. So let's take a look at what the DAC file contains then. Oops. All right, so it is basically importing from the module file and wrapping each of the, the functions in the module file into their own tasks. And there is some uh, supporter task around it to be able to set the context up. Um, so that's what the DAC file is. And there's also the requirements file. So this uh, folks should be pretty familiar with. This is the requirements that tells us what uh, Python libraries that we need to install and what versions, right? So what's really interesting here is that up top, we have three different types of library, different libraries that we installed in addition to, imported in addition to linear pi. But as we mentioned earlier, this plotting library doesn't actually help us with generating the model. So linear pi was able to recognize that and automatically remove that dependency from this packaging of the artifact and pipeline. So now we don't need to worry about installing a whole bunch of extraneous dependencies that were just for uh, exploratory data analysis. All right, and then the last file is the Docker file. So this is just a way for us to make sure that the generated files actually run. So we will basically spin up a really uh, a local Airflow instance. And this allows us to run it to make sure that everything is good. So we don't need to deploy this whole thing all the way to our production Airflow before we realize that there's something might have been generated poorly. Right. So that's what these four files are about. And again, let me try to go off script one more time and try to put in Kubeflow and see what happens. All right, there we go. So I think the module file will still look the same. The DAC file is the only thing that will look a little different. So let's make sure everything got generated. Perfect. All right, so now instead of uh, <laughs> Instead of uh, Airflow, now we have Kubeflow components and uh, tasks and things strung together to be uh, packaged into a pipeline. So all of this is available to you uh, at your fingertips. Please uh, go home and check it out or go and check it out right now. We have more advanced uh, tutorials in our repo. So let me now make sure that I'm sharing the right screen. Perfect. So there is a whole bunch of uh, additional tutorials in the uh, examples folder. Let's see. Uh oh, where'd it go? Wow. Uh, how am I having this much? Ah, oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. So this will have more tutorials around more specific uh, functionalities, more advanced uh, pipeline building. Um, more about how do we uh, use artifacts across sessions. Um, this is the quick start again, and we can also go through specific use cases uh, around how do we clean up notebooks and uh, how do we do an end-to-end -end experience for predict housing price, all the way from uh, data munging, feature engineering, modeling, and all sorts of different components, so much more complex. Uh, workflow using real data set. Yeah, so that, and, and also um, Linea does have um, some infrastructural pieces that we saw early on with the store and also with the orchestrator itself. So this uh, self-hosting Linea Pi actually also allows us to be able to, like there's a Docker file in there that allows you to set up all the necessary infra pieces uh, in a way that's more robust than what the local experience is. So yeah, that's uh, that's linear pi. That was awesome. That's uh, 
<laughs> that Kubeflow one blew my mind because those those Kubeflow pipelines are not easy to cons well, it's not easy to learn their SDK. Uh, I've been working with it for a while, but watching that produce that was like a dream come true. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Doris. That I mean, this library, there, there's a reason that I like reached out to Doris you guys and was like, please can you come to the my media? Because this we I've been talking to Doris and, and the folks at Linnea Pi for or Linnea uh for I don't even know a few months, I guess. Uh but like the first time I saw this, I was like, this is a game changer. Like for data engineers, for data scientists, for anybody data any, anybody doing anything data related. So um, yeah, and the tutorials are really self-explanatory. The website's great, the documentation's great. I've dug through it, so uh, definitely go check it out. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'll, I'll start off, I have some questions. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I'm wondering uh, what kind of support there is or will be, well, first of all, what databases are supported as a backend Right for storing components. Yeah, so the backend has two storage pieces. So there is this uh, relational database, and then there is the uh, blob store. Right. So for the relational database, uh, SQLite, uh, Postgres, uh, those are all things that we've tested. But pretty much any relational database, you just configure it in the LinearPy environment uh, file, and we would be able to start talking to it. And then for the um, the file storage, S3 is something that we integrate with. Uh, we talked about GCS earlier and um, local file storage, of course, and pretty much any file storage, like we, so far, every single one of them that we've tried has worked. So it's a very flexible uh, way of setting things up that can be tailored towards your needs. Does that include uh, for like a relational database uh, I mean, it seems like it would, right? But just for instance, like connecting to any cloud, you know, cloud SQL or anything like that. I mean, the, the connection string is slightly different. So are there any modifications that would need to be made to connect to a cloud SQL database versus, you know, just a local or on-prem? Yeah, that's a great question. I will have to get back to you on that. Okay. We haven't really tested that yet. Okay, no problem. Uh, just, just curious. Uh, the the last question I had was: Is there anything on the roadmap for integrating, uh, so uh, Databricks and PySpark, right, have their own kind of version of notebooks? Have has this been tested at all with PySpark and and Databricks? Um, yeah. So we run this in Databricks, and everything works beautifully. So. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. That was great. Uh, and then the other integration point that might be interesting for folks in the audience is that. There is an integration with MLflow as well. So there is a pretty nice uh, integration between, oh, if you want to use MLflow for model deployment, great. But if you want to use LinearPy for storing the code and additional context, now we have a pretty good handoff between the two. That's amazing. OK, well, uh, we're going to be using this heavily. I can already see it at, at, my, at my place of work, you know. Uh, so. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? You can either drop them in chat or uh, jump on the mic if you'd like. Uh, I'll just hang out for a second if anybody has any. Quick question about licensing. So is this like a typical MIT license? Or? Uh, this is Apache uh, 2.0, so feel free to use it however <laughs> you like. This is a very standard Apache 2.0 license. Yeah, hack away, Shu Hong. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so do you, like when you, when somebody put a code into your system, you clean it out. Um, what what about if there's some pri uh, proprietary kind of thing? Can are those things, can be used in here? Are you the safe? <laughs> like, so, I don't know. Yeah. You can configure the backend to live wherever you want. So if you want it to be purely on-prem, that's an option that's available to you. So data security shouldn't be an issue. Um, it's very flexible to configure. Very cool. Thank you. Is there a way to, I, I was just in, in line with security. So say someone accidentally 
right, puts, I have two questions. One, if someone accidentally has an, or not accidentally, just has an API key sitting in their notebooks, which is fairly common when someone's trying to just, you know, get something working, is there a way to filter those out or should those be filtered out beforehand uh, before it, it, you know, you run Linea Pi on top yeah. of it? Um, so I think the safest way is, of course, is to anon anonymize it. But what's really cool about Linea Pi is there is a way for, I'm trying to remember where there is a good example of this. Uh, potentially this one. So it also has a way to parameterize it very easily. So for an artifact, we can basically say this, this, and this variable, I want them to be parameters. And that can potentially you know, replace the hard-coded string with just an input variable. So now you've done anonymization through that mechanism. Great, that's awesome. Um, and kind of my, my final thing is, uh, I was, you, you actually stole my, my question, but you answered it before I even asked it. And so I saw a Docker Compose file for running workflows. So does that mean that there is a way to set it up in Docker Compose and curious about Kubernetes as well, where you can send a file to an API where it'll just kind of process it as part of a pipeline versus you running it straight from the notebook? I see. So the question is around uh, how do we talk to the orchestrator? And I, guess, I guess my I saw there was a Docker Compose workflow uh, mm -hmm. somewhere where you said, oh, you can there's a container, a way to do it via containers. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on what that entails, like how you would go about using that. I see. Yeah. So that Docker Compose file is fairly light. It's more intended for local testing than for talking to the orchestrator. So what it does is for whatever orchestration framework of your choice, we will spin up a local version of it that allows you to just run through it once to make sure that the generated file runs, it's you know generated correctly and all of that. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what the automatically generated uh, Docker file does for you. But if we want to talk about actually connecting to an actual, you know, Airflow instance uh, that's already been spun up by your organization, um, for that experience, going to the self-hosting tutorial would be a better bet. So there we actually give you more Docker files. So let me just share this tab quickly uh, to actually connect to your internal infrastructure. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. And uh, yeah, I know I said final question. Let me see if I can remember what I was just about to say. Dang, I think I've, I, I lost it. <laughs> uh, I'm around. Uh, we have a Slack that mm -hmm. folks can hop on and ask more questions as they come up. So it's on our um, it's on our GitHub, but I'm happy to drop it in the chat as well. It just to kind of further promote this. I'd love to definitely get folks involved. Uh, as we already saw that some of the uh, integrations were actually community contributed. So that was really exciting to see, um, A, that folks are so interested that they donated their time to contribute this into these integrations and they contributed because they needed it and we were just helping unblock them. Um, and the other thing is that it definitely validated that our abstractions are designed well, that they can support integrations by folks who are not developers of this code base. Yeah, so wanted to also just celebrate our community contributors, uh, Thomas, and I think Lazar is looking for a gig and absolutely phenomenal developer. So please reach out to him if anybody's hiring. Great. Um, I think, oh, that was you dropping the link, okay. Uh, if there's no other questions, uh, I want to thank you, Doris, for coming and sharing uh, Linea Pi with us. I think it's an incredible project. I plan on getting involved. I'm on the Slack channel, so everybody should definitely also go there um, and contribute, ask questions, and see uh, what other ways you would like to, or what other integrations or whatever that you'd like to see for for this project. I, you know, I think this is going to be big for sure. I think it already is. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. But um, all right, well, uh, that wraps up another session of Portland Python Pirates. Thank you, Doris. Thanks everybody for coming, and uh, we will see you next time.
Thanks. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.